recording has begun. All right. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. This is the Alliance for Community Trees webcast called The Nuts and Bolts of Fruit and Nut Trees. The AC Trees webcast series is a monthly webcast held at the lunch hour. The trainings leverage local successes by amplifying to a larger audience an organization's methods, materials, and approaches. These sessions are planned to last no more than one hour, with two presenters speaking on the same topic from slightly different perspectives, each for 10 to 15 minutes, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answers. For anyone who's interested uh, in receiving uh, credit through their State Landscape Architecture Board for having attended this session, please let me know. They usually only require a certificate of completion, which Alliance for Community Trees can provide to you. This is a program of Alliance for Community Trees. If you're not already a member organization, please think about joining. We want to thank our partner for today's webcast, the USDA Forest Service. Today's session is Nuts and Bolts of Fruit and Nut Trees. Community orchards have a vital role to play in sustainable city development. With rising energy and food costs, the need for urban populations to have easy access to fresh, nutritious produce is rising. The local nonprofits that are looking to green their communities in cities around the country can address this need by investing resources into planting fruit and nut trees. A simple fruit tree can add uh, multifaceted value to a community by stimulating community engagement, safety, and economic vitality, while also providing nutritional and environmental benefits to the community at large. But planting fruit and nut trees and caring for them and thinking about how they work in the community is slightly different from planting standard shade or ornamental trees. To teach us more today about how to plant fruit and nut trees what you should be thinking about, and how to do it right. We've got two experts, both out of Washington, D.C. Joining us on the call are, is Jim Woodworth, who is the Director of Tree Planting at Casey Trees in Washington, D.C., a graduate of the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and an ISA certified arborist. Jim previously worked with the Natural Resources Defense Council on restoring the Anacostia River through environmental advocacy promoting the watershed approach, low-impact development, and stormwater management, including the report entitled Out of the Gutter, Reducing Polluted Runoff in the District of Columbia. As director of tree planting at KC Trees, he oversees the countless tree planting projects that take place every season all across the district. Also joining us is Joshua Singer. Joshua is currently working on KC Trees tree planting department He's designed, recruited, and implemented the Urban Fruit Orchard Planting Program at Casey Trees, which will have planted close to two dozen urban fruit orchards in D.C. by the end of spring 2012. In addition, Josh is the co-creator and co-director of Wong, Friends of Wangari Gardens and, and Wangari Gardens, a community garden uh, designed this spring in Washington, D.C. So we'll get to hear uh, two different approaches, some information about horticultural perspective of fruit trees, and then implementation into a community tree planting program. We are really happy to have both Jim and Josh join us here today. Thanks so much, guys. Why don't you take it away? Hey, thanks, Leland. This is Jim here, and uh, Josh with me. Say, hey. say hello, Josh. Hello. Thanks for having us. Yeah, we're tag team on this, and um, I'll start us off with the first um, – several slides, then turn over to Josh, and then we'll wrap it up together. Um, and um, for those of you who are not familiar with Casey Trees, our mission is really canopy-focused. It's to restore, enhance, and protect the tree canopy of the nation's capital. And um, from, uh, and I think Josh and I, while we're, we work on the same roof, we actually have very different perspectives, or have, have had very different perspectives on fruit trees over the last um, several seasons. And uh, I think that that um, contrast has you know, given us a, a balanced approach to how and why and where we work with fruit trees. Um, and uh, I think as a, as a disclaimer, you know, neither of us are, are actually orchardists um, or pomologists. Um, we're both community foresters with uh, different experience, but 
our experience is through the lens of running community forestry and urban forestry programs. Um, so we are learning as we're doing, and um, I think that's where I wanted to start this discussion was um, why we're working with fruit trees. Um, it's it's a it, I think the argument can be made that it is part of our mission, but uh, from the beginning. Uh, we've always been more focused on shade trees. And if you look at our various planting programs, uh, they have a heavy shade tree tilt. And we have a canopy grow in Washington, D.C. And uh, certainly no one could argue that. Um, the argument can be made, you know, how many dwarf apple trees uh, have the benefit of a single mature white oak? Um, so, so I've always approached this with a little bit of skepticism whereas Josh has always been a little more optimistic about uh, the function and role of, of, of fruit trees. I have always been uh, more focused on canopy goals, mortality rates, costs, and how to, how to, how to actually run programs. Um, so we've always – I've been pushed, pulled, and prodded into working with fruit trees um, over the last um, probably five years. Um, you know, pushed at the top from executive director and from board members who have nostalgia for the backyard apple tree. Um, and then also responding to sort of ad hoc interest in the community uh, for fruit trees and really kind of uh, took some, some false steps forward several years back when we worked with a contract grower to um, who was – supplying us shade trees and ornamental trees to contract grow um, probably half a dozen varieties of fruit trees, uh, consulting with orchards, getting liners, um, and then growing them out as if they were um, ready to transplant like our typical two-inch caliber B&B tree, and then realizing the things were uh, – different with fruit trees, and they required a little more knowledge and learning before we plowed ahead. So we had some false starts, and we were trying to learn quickly as we go. It's a steep learning curve working with fruit trees. And um, so, you know, as you see my slides here, um, location is important. Uh, to plant an apple tree in everybody's backyard and have them expect to uh, bear fruits in the year is unrealistic. Um, so putting fruit trees into our homeowner programs didn't make a lot of sense as a first step. Um, and, uh, you know, putting trees on the streetscape does not make a lot of sense. So, you know, it doesn't uh, fold into some of our other programs in that respect. Um, Department of Environment funds us to do uh, fruit, uh, I'm sorry, to do shade trees for uh, our overlapping goals where stormwater and tree canopy are um, um, sort of mutually beneficial goals, but they would not fund us to plant fruit trees. So we, you know, we've kind of tried to find the right place to put fruit trees in our programs, and that's led us to create the opportunity to plant trees through our community tree planting program where neighborhood groups would identify places where they think fruit trees should go and then we can help them with each step from there on out. Um, so Right Tree, Right Place definitely uh, plays into this to maybe more of a degree than your typical uh, Right Tree, Right Place analysis for a particular shade tree or flowering tree. Um, and, um, and then, you know, we had some early mistakes. We tried planting, in terms of trial and error and monitoring evaluation, sort of checking ourselves. The few B&B &B fruit trees we did try to transplant early on uh, had really high mortality rates, not transplant well. And then, oh, and then we consulted with a pomologist from the University of Maryland who, who had a better understanding of this stuff and said, oh, yeah, well, you really shouldn't do B&B. &B. You should try bare roots or containerized style. So uh, we've had some false starts there. Um, and then, um, you know, more through Josh's work um, and in um, reviewing community-based applications of interest for us, uh, gauging the level of investment has been really important. Um, is this an established community garden where they have lots of knowledge about growing things generally and possibly already growing their own orchard trees? Um, or is this a landscape 
that is subject to change or the um, the level investment from the community group is is low to medium uh, well the the this decisions on the types of trees should reflect the um, status of the property the level of engagement of the uh, project organizers and uh, the capacity to to really um, see a fruit tree through over its lifespan not just planting it but bearing fruit down the road it takes a little a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of effort, or a lot of bit of knowledge and a lot of effort, depending. So those are things that we've struggled with, and currently we are we are helping fruit trees get planted through two programs, through a community tree planting program where people have the requirements are locate spaces for ten trees or more, commit to caring for the trees for at least two years, and um, and then the other program is through a rebate program where, left to their own devices, people buy trees that they can find um, at the garden center or the nursery or the Home Depot or whatever. And we actually have seen, uh, without any publicity of our own, um, a lot of interest in fruit trees through the rebate program. So people buying and doing it themselves. And um, that's been um, an interesting counterbalance for us to really gauge uh, the availability of fruit trees and the interest in fruit trees, and so sort of reinforcing our um, realization that this is something we should be engaged in because there actually is uh, interest we're realizing, or maybe it's growing interest in fruit trees. Um, so those are some of my initial thoughts in terms of um, why we got started and how we got started. Um, and then just to paint the picture, I realize a lot of people in my car are not from Washington, D.C., but for those who are, these might be familiar sites to you that um, you could go and visit and see how these orchards are doing. Um, and, um, you know, for those of you who are not from D.C., I think it's still important to provide some context to, to as to how we're going about doing this, why we're planting trees where, and, uh, you know, the extension of right tree, right place, and through our application process, where does that lead us to plant fruit trees? So of the you know, two dozen projects Josh has recruited and, and has helped implement these past two seasons, um, a fair number of them are some manner of established uh, community garden where fruit trees are going in as, a, as an additional component to that garden. They're already growing there. There's already a lot of green thumbs, um, which indicates to us that, hey, these people have success in growing things and they may be involved in the Master Gardener program, uh, or they're figuring out themselves, and they can provide a level of stewardship above and beyond what we currently can provide in-house at Casey Trees. So, you know, from A to O here, um, Allison Street, Bead Street, Common Good City Farm, some of these may be familiar to folks. Um, Friendship Community Garden is a long-standing community garden, and um, fruit trees were a brand-new aspect of, of their um, ability to grow their own food. Uh, some of these are very new sites, and, and um, we will see, and actually yet to be planted. Uh, this right, this Saturday, we work at Justice Park and Park at Lejoit and um, Ecolocity Garden at Bruce Monroe. Three new sites, uh, one of which was a school a couple of years ago. It was demolished. It's built on fill soils. And the uh, the establishment of those trees really does depend on follow-up care, uh, amending soils, and short term over the short term really monitoring to make sure those trees get established. Um, I just want to paint a picture of um, that's where half of our, our trees or our fruit trees are being planted. The other half, it's fair to say, is in schoolyards, and there the the motivation might be a little bit different. Um, we're planting in a variety of schools, mostly public elementary schools, some charter schools, and in some cases, like the photo here, this is sort of an isolated part of campus where they have a lot of grass and they have a big fence. And um, that's, you know, in some ways a great place to establish an orchard. A fence, in this case, is a great thing uh, to support an orchard. Um, protection, uh, designated place, um, place called home for the fruit trees. Um, but the and Josh can speak more to this a little bit later too. Um, but the the um, impetus for planting fruit trees in schoolyards is often uh, um, you know the fascination with growing things. It's easy to incorporate into a curriculum. Um, in some cases, these schoolyards have worked with us to already plant shade trees 
and ornamental trees, and fruit trees is the next step um, in their green campus. And in other cases, this is a brand new thing, and uh, we're we're tapping into uh, gardening resources that may already exist at the school through the school or a teacher or another nonprofit that has deeper roots at the school in more of a continuous year-round um, uh, program. So there's a real gamut there uh, in terms of how those plantings look in their landscape. They might be integrated in more of an organic sort of edible landscape, or they might be a very formal orchard. Um, but again, that's uh, roughly a dozen schools that we worked at over the past two seasons um, to plant trees. So brand new, not bearing fruit yet. We have to see how they do. Um, and um, that leads me to um, the, the next component of this, which is really distinguishing between fruit trees and shade trees and how they're different, what works and what doesn't work. I alluded to our problems with B&B &B trees with, with respect to fruit trees not doing well in terms of transplanting. And the recommendation really has been to focus on bare roots and container. And for those of you who worked with bare root before, you know that's very tricky. Bare root is um, highly perishable. Uh, logistics are, are of paramount concern. Um, however, it may be the best plant, um, given uh, a lot of research in urban forestry about the problems with root systems, bare root may be the way to go for all plantings, but for orchards, particularly for larger scale orchard plantings, bare root is probably the best way to go. Um, and one project we did recently in partnership with Bread for the City, a food, a food charity, uh, we helped them plant uh, an orchard of about a thousand pieces, and that was done bare root. But you know, you have to keep those in the shade house, keep them moist. The timing is really critical to turn those around and get them in the ground as soon as possible. Whereas planting with containerized stock gives you a lot of flexibility to store trees, and you know, working in a schedule in a school calendar year to store things for weeks or a month, keeping them wet and moist, but uh, they're highly portable and easy to manipulate with kids. And um, container stock has been the large percentage of what we've planted uh, with some success this past year. As opposed to all of our other plants for our shade tree programs are B&B &B stock, so two-inch caliper or six to eight foot caliper or height trees that are B&B. &B. Uh, most of our fruit trees have been much smaller. Um, three, five, seven, fifteen gallon containerized stock. <coughs> uh, I alluded to durability, perishability, and establishment. Um, you know, in a public space, uh, durability uh, is is a big concern. Um, we often like to plant two inch caliper shade trees in public spaces like parks and schoolyards because of um, the human uh, component of what's going on in those spaces and. Um, a lot of our fruit trees are best planted when they're small, and the smaller they are, the more fragile they are. Easier it is to, you know, mistake a single trunk twig looking like a fruit tree for, you know, a weed tree or something, and it's very easy to snap the leader and um, uh, very easy to weed whack it to death and, and so forth. So durability is an issue. Perishability is an issue. Working with bare root stock um, and then establishments, um, you know, there's, there's uh, different schools of thought in terms of how long it takes certain plants to get established uh, versus how durable they are. And while we work with two-inch caliber B&B &B stock that takes two to three years, we're finding actually it takes closer to three years to get established. Um, the smaller the stock, the quicker it gets established in terms of getting roots out, but it still takes a while to train that tree and get it to a size of which it's durable for a public space. And um, those are all factors that we have to weigh when we're sourcing particular trees for a particular site. Um, is it fenced off? Is it secure? Who's using it? Who's traveling through it? Is there a dog park that's uh, next door? You know, so forth. Lots of things there to think about. And then um, some of the basics, you know, horticulturally or arboriculturally speaking, um, when we go to tag trees in the nursery for shade tree programs, we're looking for nice street leaders, um, balanced uh, canopies and um, you know the absence of uh, co-dominant leaders and tight crotches and all that and and uh, and we are thinking about structurally pruning those trees you know one or two or three years out 
and elevating for sidewalk clearance and pedestrian and eye conflicts and uh, um, all that, sight line security. But with fruit trees, it's totally different. And Josh will talk a little bit more about this. Um, but um, you know, the form is totally different. They don't have a strong central leader. They branch low. Um, there's there's conflicts there with lawnmowers potentially down the road. Uh, that level of pruning is a different ISA training, um, and uh, actually, I don't think there is an ISA training for fruit tree pruning. Uh, but there's you know there's a nice six-step video for structurally tr structurally pruning uh, shade trees. There isn't one for for fruit trees, uh, at least not that I'm aware of. Not yet. Uh, not yet. Maybe we'll do that next. Um, so all those things uh, at the very beginning are different. You're dealing with a different. Uh, you're, I don't want to say this. You're, you're comparing apples to oranges, but that's a horrible example. You're, you're comparing oaks to apples or oaks to uh, to figs, um, and uh, so those are some of the things we had to realize early on. Um, we couldn't source these trees from our same nurseries. We had to go to specialty nurseries, um, and Josh will talk more about the sources of our trees. But I'm gonna. And I think at this point I'm going to turn it over to Josh. To well, if I can make another note on sure, yeah. bear root, um, uh, in order to to harvest bear roots um, at nurseries, they have to um, they do it while they're dormant. So bear roots are, are basically only available to plant in the spring. So if you want to do fall plantings, you're kind of forced to use container stock. Um, yeah. Bear root is only specifically for springs, which is another option, um, another thing to think about. And it puts a crimp on our scheduling if you have a fall season and a spring season. Uh, so we uh, another reason we've been forced to use much more container stack. Uh, so, yeah, good point, Josh. And I'll slide seven. Go ahead. All right. Um, so, again, my name is Josh Singer. Um, and thanks so much for having us. I'll talk about some more of the factors to think about when um, we're uh, choosing the right trees um, for the right place. So, you're going to talk about our logo, the right tree, the right place. And I also like to think with fruit trees, it's also the right person that we're kind of looking for, and we're trying to make that perfect match. Um, so some of the things that we consider, first you have to look at your hardiness zone um, and make sure what trees um, can grow in the general area. Um, a great way to, to figure out this is to kind of contact your local nursery. They, they know exactly what trees can grow and what, and what hardiness zones. And, um, and especially now with the, the changing environment, I know in D.C. we just changed a different hardiness zone, which is um, important to know and with certain trees because uh, things like peach trees, they need a, a strong frost to produce fruit the next the next year. Or um, with maybe like figs um, and, and more of your, you know, your tropical um, trees, they don't do so well with, uh, with the colder weather. And you can kind of push it a little bit. I know there's certain varieties of figs and there's certain trees that we kind of, um, we just give a little bit extra protection during the winter. And if you do that for a couple of years until it's established, you can definitely, you know, stretch the hardiness zone a little bit. But um, it's definitely something that you want to make sure you're and, um, buying the right tree for the right hardiness zone. So another thing we um, think about is um, just, you know, the general maintenance. Like, one big thing is, like, pests and, and, and diseases. This is a um, – uh, I mean, this could be – depending on what kind of trees. I mean, this could be very low maintenance, you know, if you're looking at certain varieties, like figs and pawpaws, which have very low, you know, um, pests and diseases to worry about. Um, or, I mean, if, if you want – you know, if you're going for things like peaches, this, this, this is a big deal. There's a lot of pests and a lot of diseases out for pe peaches and, and, um, and apples and things like that. So we, um, what I've been doing is I kind of um, broke it off into three different categories um, of low, medium, to high. Low maintenance being more of like figs, pawpaws, persimmons, and um, and uh, uh, jujubes, uh, mulberries, things like that. That basically, I mean, all you have to do is just water them and um, occasionally some sanitation pruning. And then you have like medium, like things like Asian pears, um, uh, uh, plums that, that take a little bit more. You know, um, you have um, some things you have to do to protect from pests and disease, but it's not too terrible. And then you know, high maintenance you know, apples, peaches, uh, you know, um, apricots. I kind of go back and forth with cherries. Cherries have um, a lot of diseases, and, and, and birds will, will kill your cherries. But, and so, but at the same time, cherries uh, fruit. Um, between their, their bloom period and fruiting period, it's only uh, two months. So you really are, you have to actively you know, protect the trees in, in a two-month period. So I go back and forth between that medium and high. But uh, these are all factors to, to, to think about. Like if we have someone who has no experience with, with any fruit trees, we're not going to plant them a, a peach orchard. But, um, you know, we may get, give them, you know, some fig trees, and especially if you have like, an, uh, like a school. We, we, for one aspect, I think it's really cool to plant, you know, um, trees that, that kids don't know about, like figs and pawpaws. 
you know, it's a great educational piece. And also, at schools, you, you, we don't know, I mean, sometimes there's not uh, um, a huge investment, especially during the summer, so we might go for the lower maintenance trees. But um, if we have a, a very active, you know, community garden with um, active members, especially like Jim was mentioning, master gardeners, you know, um, we would love to try, you know, the more um, peaches and apples and, and things like that, which are, um, you can grow in urban environments. There's a, um, when I started this program, there was a lot of people that said that you can't, but um, just through interviewing and research, I found many organizations in D.C., like Common Good City Farm is one, that grow beautiful peaches and beautiful apples, and they don't spray, and it's all organic, um, but they put a lot of work into that. So it is possible. It's just about how much work you want to you wanna put into it. Um, so, I mean, the basics, you know, you know, like if you want just lowest maintenance, I mean, of, of all trees, you know, shade and fruit, you know, everything needs, you know, you need to have a watering plan, you need to have, you know, you need to be able to weed it, you know, mulch it, um, especially with basics of, um, um, you need to have some kind of fall orchard sanitation. Uh, um, you need to, especially um, to prevent, you know, diseases and, and, and uh, things like that, you need to have some kind of sanitation program where you just, you know, you, you pick up a leaf, you know, um, any kind of, um, Disease branch, you want to make sure you, you can you dispose of that properly. You want to, um, you know, just make sure you make it a clean environment for your for your trees. It's not putting mildew on, you know, with wet leaves on the floor. Josh, can you still compost on site um, and maintain a sanitary environment? Yeah, I think composting is, is a great way to to maintain that um, environment. And when you get to things like diseases, you can compost um, like a disease branch, but the thing is you have to, know, you have to make sure your compost is, is getting up to that 155 degree um, temperature. So unless you have like one of those like turkey baser, you know, for not, um, measuring you know thermometers, um, you, you might want to consider just throwing away the, the diseased um, um, parts. But everything else, you know, like the, the leaves that fall out, the, the, the fruit that might fall before you harvest it, you know, go ahead and compost that. That makes great compost. So the next um, thing we can, um, uh, is uh, the kind of the, the pruning. There's, there's, there's a lot more factors to think about with, with pruning. Like uh, Jim has said, with shade trees, you know, we, we focus more on structural pruning, making the tree as, as strong as possible. But, um, with, you know, with fruit trees, you know, we do a lot of different kinds of, like, sanitation pruning. You know, anytime you, you see, you know, anything diseased you want to take off, um, we, we really want to open up the canopy and, and with um, fruit trees. Uh, when you have a really dense canopy that holds in moisture, you, you're really um, you're risking uh, different kinds of mildews and, and, and fungal diseases and things like that. So you want to, you know, have a, um, you want to prune it pretty well to, to open that inside of that canopy. And that's more with the high maintenance trees like peaches and, and apples. You really want to, you know, focus on, on, on opening up that canopy. Um, as opposed to things like figs and pawpaws, you can, you, it's not that much of a concern. Um, the next, another thing to think about is uh, spraying. There's a lot. Um, we've been kind of focusing on different organic um, sprays. And, um, uh, one of the main things that um, well, I've been kind of using a combination of one. Um, I've been really pushing this uh, uh, this spray called uh, uh, Surround. Uh, Surround is, is like a clay. Uh, uh, I think it's called calamine uh, mixture that you, you mix with water and you can spray the, the entire tree. You want to start spraying um, right um, when, when the fruit tree starts blossoming. And what that does is it creates a, a barrier, a, a, a edible, clean barrier um, over all your leaves and on all your um, fruit as, as they, they, they grow. And that prevents any kind of um, it prevents any kind of insects to get on that fruit. It prevents a lot of different diseases from getting onto that fruit and that tree. And you have to reapply it maybe about twice a month. But it's a um, it's, it's right now. I mean, from every fruit orchard I've talked to, this is the leading organic spray that people are using. And it's clean. Um, you can eat it, but I, um, but you also can um, wash. A lot of people will just wash off their fruit when they're done with this organic spray. Um, and then, then I think it's important to um, kind of provide these um, different kinds of organic management plans. Uh, there's, there's too many to talk about. There's like a thousand different kinds of uh, things you could do. Uh, really fun things, you know, from mixing like Tabasco and water, you know, mixtures to keep away birds to like wrapping individual fruits with, with bags. And there's just enormous amount of things that you can do to kind of um, uh, that keep on that organic thing. And that's another thing. I've been working on a management plan. If anybody would like to contact me later, I can, I'm, uh, would love to um, email you with that. With you know, I have about 80 pages of different things you could do. Um, and most common thing that people ask me about with fruit trees is um, pests. Especially squirrels. That's like the number one thing that we hear about. Like, I have this beautiful, you know, apple tree, but the squirrels ate all the fruit. 
and that's um, you know that's that's the problem with the urban um, urban fruit orchards is dealing with different kind of pests like deer. You know, you could build fence. You know, um, and, and and birds. You could do netting. I know another thing people do with trees. They they hang um, you know CDs and shiny things from a tree that will a lot of times scare away the birds. But squirrels are kind of the, the hardest part right now. Uh, people are really um, um, having trouble with squirrels, and I've done a lot of research on squirrels. And you know, there's little things you know that you could do, like that Tabasco mi mixture and, and different things like that. But really, the best thing for squirrels is um, to get rid of them. And like, I don't um, advocate killing them or hunting them, but there are humane traps. A lot of people will actually put these traps in, in their trees or at the base of the trees, and um, you know, they will capture the squirrel alive, and then you just transport them to you know a local forest. Somebody else's orchard. Yeah, so you send them, you know, competition. You know, the neighbor you don't like. You know, just release that that squirrel out into uh, their yard. But um, that's basically the, the best way with squirrels. But I mean, you, I mean, and and I've also, um, I also, I did. Well, I was reading about decoy trees that they can use. A lot of people are using. If you know you have a, a oak tree with like a family of squirrels, and there's a and your apple trees right next to that, uh, one thing you could do is, is um, plant a mulberry tree or something that you you, you know doesn't have you don't care so much about the fruit. And um, those squirrels are looking for the easiest food; they're not very selective. So if you put something that they like right in front of that tree, they're going to go to that tree first before you know. And so hopefully you can get that. You know. So the next one is uh, the space considerations. Uh, so we, I mean, there's, there's three basic kinds of uh, fruit trees uh, out there. You, we have standard, semi-dwarf, and, and dwarf, and uh, they, they um, and they, uh, they're kind of different from for all trees. Like a, a, a standard plum isn't going to be as big as a standard apple, but on the average, a standard tree gets about um, 20 to 30 feet, depending on your variety, um, tall, and, and about the same wide. And a semi-dwarf is uh, about 15 to 20 feet, and a dwarf tree. It's around 10 to 15 um, feet. But, I mean, if you know how to prune these trees, you can make a standard tree into a 10-foot tree. It's all up to, you know, how you want to prune it. But if you're, think if you're thinking you're just going to let these grow and not going to prune them, then, um, you know, keep the size into consideration. And when it comes to spacing, um, what I generally have rule of thumb, because um, a, lot, a lot of places that we work with in urban environments have a small amount of spacing. So... Um, but a lot of places want to squeeze as many trees as they can. Uh, my rule of thumb is not to have anything within 10 feet, especially with, um, with dwarf and semi-dwarf. If you have a stand, if you're putting some standard trees, you know they're going to be big. You might want to go beyond 10 feet, but um, I don't try to keep anything closer than 10 feet. And one uh, a trick when if you're laying out a orchard style, you know, uh, tr one trick to get more sunlight um, into the, your trees if you have them in rows is to stagger the rows and kind of zigzag them. And that will give it more of an opportunity, you know, so you can you know, squeeze trees a little bit closer. And then it, um, there's a lot of creative um, way, uh, ways and, and different creative varieties that were used. You can get, I mean, with, when you have small amount of spacing, you can get really creative. Um, uh, things like exfoliate and columnar. Um, exfoliate trees are trees that uh, tend, they're trained to grow along walls. They're two-dimensional trees. And these are great because you don't have to worry about the circular canopy. You can actually, you know, just grow them along a wall, a fence, you know, things like that. And apples and pears work really good with exfoliate. You can exfoliate anything, but you need a tree that's somewhat bendable, and apples and pears are the best. And you can buy them pre-trained, uh, or you can just buy a, a whip um, a baby um, fruit tree and train them yourself. And the columnar are great. Columnar are trees that grow straight up, and they don't branch out. So if you don't um, have a lot of space, you can just plant a row, of, you know, a couple rows of columnar trees that just grow straight out. But you have to be, um, but you have to be really uh, diligent on, on you know, um, thinning or removing. You don't want um, these trees to have too much fruit, or they're going to um, possibly fall over. Okay, so the next uh, consideration um, is basically what we go, you know, um, considerations of, of, of any trees that we plant, um, just the minor changes with fruit trees. With space, I've already talked about space, um, a lot, but we have kind of two different kinds of space that people choose. One is that they go for the orchard, like the, the rows, the trees, and try to you know, get as much as possible. And then there's a lot, and then there's um, other people that kind of go for the landscape design. Um, I, I definitely recommend um, the forest garden approach, where you try to make, um, you know, you scatter some trees out, have different levels of trees. Um, if you bring some companion plants and things like that, uh, that will actually, you know, bring nitrogen to the soil. Um, it, it's a great, and it builds a great environment for your trees. It's really up to you how you want to design the, the orchard. Uh, sunlight is a huge, um, huge issue with, with, with fruit trees. The majority of your fruit trees need full sunlight, six to eight hours to harvest. Um, 
um, any kind of decent fruit. Some of them will survive in partial shade, but they won't get, you know, bare fruit. So, um, but there are a couple exceptions. Like if you're in an environment, um, say you're in, in an area that doesn't have a lot of sunlight, you know, you know things like pawpaw. Pawpaw is the most perfect understory fruit tree. It, um, it loves, you know, um, shade. Uh, it'll do really well in shaded areas. And also things like persimmons and service berries and mulberries, they, they'll, they'll do, be do better in full sunlight, but they do really well in, in, in partial shade. And, um, and if you do have some trees in shade, I mean, like, they, 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 you know, they can, you know, they might still bear fruit. It's just not going to be as much as, as you would in a full sunlight area. Uh, soils is really big um, with soils, um, especially so much with our shade tree program. I mean, it, we can plant a tree; it may not be the best of soil, but it will survive, and, that, and, and we're happy with that. But with fruit trees, you can plant a tree in, in bad soil, and it will survive, but it won't bear any fruit. So that's a different, you know, factor to kind of consider. And there's a lot of things that you can do to kind of help um, um, remediate the soil. If you know you have really bad soil, well, one thing is you, you definitely want to, you know, test the soil. You want to do a soil test to figure out what kind of soil you're working with. If it's, you know, too acidic, if it's too, you know, alkaline, if it's. Um, and I know, like University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Like, I've researched them all, and, and they do complete soil tests with heavy metals and everything for ten dollars. It's a really great place to, to do that. And also I've done, um, I've researched a lot with DDOE, uh, I've read all their studies, and they found that heavy metals like lead do not transfer to um, fruit, uh, fruit and fruit trees. The like fruit tree will, will, will absorb the stuff, but it won't, you know, tra um, transfer it to the fruit. So, um, but I mean, that's up to you if you want to, you know, if you do have a heavy metal soil, if you do want to, you know, plant it, or if you want to do things to remediate the soil, like remove it and, and bring in more soil. It's totally up to you. Uh, but some of the things you could do, um, one of the things that, that, that fruit trees really um, benefit from, and, well, all trees, is that, um, uh, the Maya Mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza. Sorry, I, I always uh, mispronounce that. But mycorrhiza is a huge thing that will help. And one of the things that, that will help um, build this, um, um, this, this fungal um, uh, symbiotic uh, relationship is, um, well, there's a couple of things you could do. Like uh, if you use wood chips, you know, ground it up recently from, from um, your local arborist and, um, that makes great mulch that's very pro-fungal and it will really increase your chances to, to build this mycorrhiza. Uh, another thing is um, uh, I just recently went to a Michael Phillips where, uh, workshop where he does a lot about holistic um, uh, fruit tree care. And one thing he does is he goes to um, the nearest uh, forest, finds a really healthy tree, and then just grabs a handful of dirt somewhat deep you know, next to that base and full of that, that mycorrhiza fungal and then brings it back and mixes it with the soil. So that is, a, you know, there's a lot of great things you can do. Um, if, 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 your, if your soil is low in nutrients, though, I definitely recommend some soil remediation, um, um, especially if you have a couple months before you're planting, you know, lay out some cardboard to kill the grass, put some compost or some manure over it and some wood chips on top, and that's going to really help remediate your soil and bring some nutrients. So um, the next thing to talk about is... Um, Moisture and drainage. So just about every tree, um, fruit tree, really enjoys, you know, like um, good drainage. So if you got, I mean, don't plant a tree on the bottom of a hill um, or in, a, in kind of a bowl. Well, one, um, I mean, you, you, the water's going to puddle and it's not going to do that well. And another thing, when you plant a tree, you kind of want to plant fruit trees more um, up on the hill than on the bottom because that's going to, um, you're going to have more circulation and it's going to stay warmer. Uh, as opposed to if it's on the bottom of a of a um, of a hill, you, could, you know it's going to have less circulation, less drainage, and less. Um, uh, it's going to going to relatively be colder. Um, and also, you want to make sure you know when you're watering these trees, water just the soil. Do not water you know the the the, the leaves because this is again. I mean, fruit trees are very prone to different kinds of mildews and and different kinds of uh, fungal and bacterial um, diseases. And, and so if you keep the leaves as dry as possible and um, put the fruit tree in a well-circulated, um, air aerated area and make sure to prune the inside of the, the tree to get that air and sunlight into that tree, that should help you, you know, minimize your, your, your diseases and, and your mildews. And, um, so not also thing, pollination is huge. Um, so crop pollination, I'm learning that um, crop pollination means a, a variety of different things um, of, for, like, apples. Cross pollination. You want to have two different varieties of apples, and you want to um, contact, when you're buying these from the, your, your nursery, you want to contact the nursery and make sure that these actually work together. Because um, a lot of different apple, you know, a lot of different trees will, will, will pollinate at different times, and they won't, you know, so make sure they pollinate at the same time. Um, things, but other things like pawpaws, they can, um, they need to cross pollinate, but um, you can actually use two of the same variety to cross pollinate. Um, 
And the thing is, there's a lot of trees that are self-fertile that you can plant just by themselves. But um, always, you know, whenever you have plant more than one of the of the, um, a fruit tree, um, all the fruit, all fruit trees will cross pollinate even if they don't need to, and it will always produce better fruit. Um, so I, I, um, as we go through the pests and disease, so we basically I just have a two-prong approach, and I talked a little bit about this already. I mean, there's it, it, just too many diseases in the pest out there to focus on each one of them. So what um, we've kind of been focusing on is, one, is we use that, that surround um, organic spray, that clay spray, and that will protect it from most insects and, and a lot of diseases. Um, and two, um, I think just keeping the tree as healthy as possible. Um, this, again, is something that Michael Phillips. Uh, the some, a fruit tree expert um, talks a lot about that. And there's a lot of holistic um, uh, sprays, and he uses a lot of, of, of lean oils and compost teas and garlic solutions and things like that. Um, I, I'm not going to get into all that, um, but um, I definitely recommend if you're looking for um, some healthy sprays to, to look up Michael Phillips online, and there's some great um, recommendations. Oh. Anything else on that? Yeah, we're going to the next. So in terms of, of uh, management, I think we talked a lot about this already. Um, so the low management, we, we, um, it's just basically watering, weeding, and, and some mulching. Um, and these are big jujubes, mulberries. Jujubes are kind of date-like trees or are, are very delicious. Uh, most nut trees um, uh, tend to be very resilient. I have a few. There are a couple of them out there that need some maintenance, but most of them need very little maintenance, um, pawpaws, persimmons, and service berries. And these, I, I've ma mainly been pushing the low maintenance trees. Uh, I, I think, especially at, at, for your first planting, um, um, one, I think it's a great educational tool to show people what kind of, you know, these fruits that people aren't normally out there, you know, see. And two, I think it's just good for people to get, you know, um, a handle on what fruit trees taste, you know. And but um, also, if you have people who are more interested, you know, medium um, uh, like cherries and Asian pears and plums, you know, they take some pruning, um, some pest management. And then you have high uh, maintenance trees like apples, apricots, um, European pears, and peaches. I want to make a distinction between Asian pears and European pears. A lot of people will, will recommend not to plant European pears anywhere but um, Texas because there, um, there's a disease, really nasty disease called fire blight. And if, you, if your pear gets that, uh, your European pear, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically over for that pear. Asian pears are very resistant, uh, resistant to fire blight. Um, they're more hard. They, um, they're like an apple. Um, I think they're delicious. Um, and European pears also, you can't pick ripe. You have to pick it and then store it in the refrigerator for a couple of weeks. So it is a long process. So I've been really pushing people towards Asian pears as opposed to European pears. That's great, Josh. I was wondering where I think he and I have some overlapping interests is the, the, low, the low input fruit trees here. I like a lot of these because they're, they're unique to the landscape. They offer a lot of their benefits besides the fruits, interesting forms. Uh, interesting foliage um, and you, trees that are good for small shady sites and, and uh, can really be tucked into lens in unique ways, the fig versus the service berry versus the pawpaw. Um, so those, those six trees, those five or six or half a dozen trees have seen a lot of play in a lot of our programs. So um, I think we'll have, hopefully we'll see some success there in terms of our mortality rates and how that bears out over the next couple of years. Uh, so another factor is just building uh, the maintenance and, and the stewardship. I think I went over most of this already, so I'll just skim through the water weeding, mulching. Uh, protection is really big, um, especially a lot of these trees, like I, I mentioned earlier, fig trees um, and certain like pomegranates and things like that uh, um, don't uh, are, do well in this area, but um, especially the first couple of years after planting, they don't do too well in, um, in the, in the um, winter. So some of the things you could do if you know it's going to be a really bad winter, like if it goes below 10 degrees, you can um, have some breathable fabric like burlap. You can wrap it up with that. Uh, make sure you plant these trees at, um, on the south side of a wall because um, the, the, the harsh uh, winds in the winter are coming from the north. So um, uh, try to get as much protection as possible to that wind. Um, try to plant these trees high up as opposed to lower. It will give you more, um, more ability. Um, it will you know, give more protection from, um, from harsh winds. On low areas, the winds tend to like, you know, it tends to create these frost pockets that you want to kind of avoid. Uh, when it comes to, you know, talk about pollination. One thing I want to mention about um, 
Uh, pawpaws are one of my favorite trees. They're fantastic, but um, the, uh, the biggest problem is, is the pollination. They don't pollinate very well, so try to plant those really close to each other. And I've actually heard of a lot of people actually pollinating um, pawpaw trees with a, of a paintbrush, you know, um, just going over one tree and then going over another and trying to pollinate yourself. Uh, Fruit thinning is a really important thing I wanted to talk about. Um, a lot of these trees um, need to be, um, they, they produce too much fruit, um, especially things like plums and peaches. And it's important, um, well, peaches you can, you can, um, fruit, you can thin while, um, with just the blossoms, but most fruit you want to thin when they, when they first start, you know, um, producing the fruit when they're about the size of a dime. You want to look and look for the best, you know, um, fruit and try to thin out all the rest. You want to space them out about three to four inches at least per fruit because you don't want, um, when they grow eventually to the full size, you don't want them to be touching because if they do touch, you know, they're going to rub and, and, and it's going to create some bacteria and, and, and some nasty stuff. So you want to, you know, you want to, and, and at the same time, if you thin them out, it's going to have more nutrients and more sugar for, for the, um, the rest of the fruit so you're going to have a better quality and better tasting fruit. Uh, another thing I want to talk about is harvesting. Um, so there's a lot of factors of harvesting from uh, ac um, accessibility to height, like figs. Um, figs you don't have to prune at all. They do well. But if you want to get in there sometimes, you, I mean, you've got to get in there and, and, um, and prune the, um, the lower branches, you know, maybe in, uh, just to get access to it. A lot of different trees, like I know I thought someone had an um, awesome, uh, beautiful pear tree, but she couldn't, you know, um, she couldn't reach the, the, the pear. So there's a lot of tools, you know, from um, uh, orchard ladder to what I think is really great is um, I, I saw there's a harvesting pool that um, has a little cup at the end and, and like a little scissors. And, you, you, you know, it's really easy if you have a really tall tree just to kind of stick that pole up and, and grab it and protect it from falling off. Um, and, and also make, make sure to know when to when you know when these fruit you know research when these fruits are ripe. Some of them you need to pick before they're ripe, and some of them you know in store for a while, and some of them you can take you know ripe straight from the from the um, tree. So definitely you know read up on on that. It's a lot to think about um, with our traditional shade trees. It's we're thinking about two or three or four years worth of mulch, water, weed, do some pruning, and we're done. Uh, but uh, raising an orchard can be um, a multi-year and exhausting effort. Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely a commitment. You don't want, you know, you want to find people that are committed to these orchards, and um, that's why we, we mainly focus through community gardens and, and, and uh, school gardens because these people aren't going anywhere. This is what you know they're committed. You know. I think at this point we we just have some some images to flip through, and then uh, some final thoughts. Maybe some of these photos will spur some questions give you an idea of the variety of sites and the forms of trees and so forth and the logistics of our plantings. Um, and then uh, we'll wrap it up with a couple of final thoughts. Uh, for me, I'm thinking about you know how to build an orchard program. We have a citizen forestry program where we train folks on urban forestry. Um, are we reaching a critical mass where we need to have a new training for citizen orchardists? Uh, Josh is quickly becoming our resident staff orchardist, uh, but it's clear to us that for these projects to have longer term success, we need to build in uh, follow-up and technical assistance of various kinds, and uh, that involves identifying the other partners out there that know more than we do about fruit trees, and um, longer term, different kinds of long term plans, um, and, um, and then, you know, Josh thinking in a lot more detail about what the orchardist needs for success. The right tools, um, which are different than our typical urban forestry tools, the kaolin sprays, the burlap wraps, uh, even alternatives to mulch like companion plants. Um, so that's some food for thought there in terms of next steps possibly for us, but uh, for those of you who are just beginning fruit trees to think longer term about uh, what it might take for a successful orchard program to uh, to bear fruit, pun intended. <laughs> I think we'll wrap it up there. Uh, hopefully there's still time for some questions. And um, here's our email contact information for those of you who um, want to follow up with either of us offline about any of this. Thanks very much, Leland. Turn it over back to you. Thank you very much, Jim and Josh. That was great and chock full of information uh, for our many listeners. We really appreciate it. And you're right, let's turn it over to some questions. I think we're going to have a bunch. To do this, uh, 
Anyone who's listening who'd like to ask a question, you can use that Q&A tab at the top of your screen. Either type in a question there and we'll uh, call on you to uh, ask it over the phone, or you can just raise your hand and we'll call on you. Uh, to get started, while people are typing in their questions or raising their hands, guys, I have a, my first question for you is that this seems so impressive and, and uh, developing an orchard program sounds um, like such a full project, but such a fruitful one. Um, what, are, how, what have you found in terms of response from community members about uh, how they are using fruit trees? You know, are, how are they as stewards? Has that worked out for you yet? I think the response is it's too soon to tell. Josh will give you a different answer. Well, I've done a lot of outreach and looking for different spots to have um, these fruit orchards, and, and there's a mixture of excitement um, when you mention fruit trees. Uh, the general, um, uh, the general imp um, uh, response is, is a lot of excitement. People love fruit trees, but, uh, but it's also accompanied with a lot of hesitation um, uh, with, from lack of knowledge of, um, of how to do these trees. And I think that that's why it's so important to provide the, the ongoing technical experience uh, you know, assistance, like we're, we're developing pruning workshops, you know, that, that will be annual. We're, we're developing work class, you know, um, fruit um, classes. And I think and I, everyone that gets an uh, orchard would give them our organic fruit tree management plan. So I think it, there's excitement, but I think you kind of have to hold there and help them know that this is something that if they're willing to put the investment, then they, they can, you know, they, they can do this. Okay. Great. Following up. Um, just some questions that we've gotten over the line. Uh, what do you uh, – okay, a couple questions. One is about uh, nut trees and nut varieties, and wondering if you can just ad address a little bit uh, what kinds of nut trees you've planted and, and how that works. We're doing this for our first time this season. Uh, I think uh, some almonds and uh, – Almonds, hazelnuts, pecans. Um, I think those are the three nuts we're, we're about to plant this season. So we don't know yet. Um, I'm sure other people have grown nut trees out there with a lot more success. It, ours are just going on the ground, so uh, it's something we want to expand. Um, and, uh, yeah, they haven't, um, they haven't produced yet, so don't know. <laughs> We're helpful, though. Okay. Uh, we've got a question from Robbie Astrov. Robbie, if you could follow the directions uh, to ask your question over the phone. All right. We might not have Robbie anymore, so I'll, I'll ask that question for him. Uh, what about the response of city parks department, um, sort of city arborists, and political um, folks or government folks? Are, do they get it? Yes, um, and some of them are very cautious um, with reason, um, and different agencies have different responses. Uh, DC Public Schools was initially very enthusiastic because they were actually entertaining the thought of, hey, could we do a local orchard that could produce fruit for the school system's cafeteria? Uh, that has not panned out yet, but... I think that's resulted in a lot of referrals to us when they realize that their individual school has an interest in fruit trees. So definitely some support from the school systems. Uh, with respect to the Parks Department, yes, they're interested. Uh, some of their checkoffs are, hey, let's make sure that nut tree is not near our parking lots. We don't want people tripping on uh, fill in the blank what kind of nut it is. Um, never mind that oaks have acorns and so forth. Uh, lots of tripping houses out there, but Oh, the fruit tree is a new tripping hazard, so we want to keep this one at bay. Um, some concerns about rats and stuff, but um, for the most part, our city officials know that community gardens are a center, a strong center of community in a neighborhood, and the tree is just another element to that. So it's not um, a new cell. It's, it's helping bolster something that's already there. Um, I think the the issue of sustainability and self-supported agriculture and that is um, gaining more traction. Um, you know, helped bread for the city with an orchard. Um, we'll see how that goes. But I think um, you know times are tough. There's always going to be somebody out there who wants to grow their own thing and do it themselves. So I think we'll see a lot more interest 
in that area because of that motivation. Uh, but generally, um, yes, we have received receptive response from the agencies that are permitting these on public space. Great. Uh, we've got a question now uh, from Bob Baines, who's had a few questions. Bob, if you could follow the instructions to uh, ask your question out loud over the phone. Hopefully we've got Bob. While he's uh, calling in, uh, his question was about the importance of removing unharvested fruit for the success of... Uh Stand by while our printer fires off. Hey, All go right. ahead, Josh, you answer this. Um, uh, that's very important, um, uh, especially for certain varieties, like, like things like peaches and, and plums. Um, I mean, some of the reason why they're higher maintenance is, is they produce a lot of fruit, and sometimes it's hard to keep up with them. Um, and that's, I mean, if you let them fall on the ground, they're, they're going to rot, uh, you know, and they're going to attract, you know, uh, different inse insects and, and, and um, animals. So that's one of the reasons why um, we're not just planting a bunch of peach trees with, you know, people that uh, have low, uh, you know, investment. You know, we're kind of saving that for the community gardens who are going to maintain these, these fruit orchards. And if you can, you know, just clean up the orchard, you know, uh, once or twice a week, you know, take all the fruit that's fallen. I mean, it's very good. And it's, it's awesome compost, you know, um, as long as you're able to cover it up and compost it. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a very important issue that you need to stay on, on top of. Um, things like, you know, figs and, and, and mulberries, uh, it's not so bad. Um, but, I mean, for things like apples, and, and I mean, they're, gonna, they're definitely going to attract things and they're going to rot a lot worse. Great. Uh, we've had a few questions from Nina Beth Cardin. Nina, if you could please press uh, star six to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hmm. All right. I mean, Nina. Great. Right. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Um, my question, in part, was also about rats, but you seem to indicate that uh, this was not as bad a problem as you thought. But I'd like you to talk a little bit more about that. But my, the other problem I had, the other question I had, was you mentioned the study about um, heavy metals and toxins being absorbed by the tree and being um, sequestered by the tree, but not being transferred to the fruit. So if you could talk a little bit more about that, and in particular, give us a citation for that study, because that's uh, a, a, a figure and a date on that people are going to want to know that we can back up with firm, uh, firm sources. Oh, yeah, I would be happy um, to, to send that link to anyone who wants to contact me at the jsinger at kcttrees.org. Um, I, um, I, I approached uh, many different people. DDOE was one of the people trying to figure out, you know, what um, – there's a lot of different things about planting trees in, in the high, heavy metal areas and contaminated soils. And um, for the most part, um, anyone that actually took the time to, to do these studies, um, I had mainly, um, especially DDOE, had mainly um, read more about the results and not so much the, the studies, but I'd be happy to send that so you, you could see how they, how they did that. But um, from the findings, um, uh, from uh, I have yet to find a finding that says that heavy metals do are transported into the fruit. Every finding I, I found and all the results I, I found um, uh, say that it doesn't transport um, into a, into the um, the fruit. But like I said, I'd be happy to, to, to forward that to whoever um, wants to contact me. And actually, uh, Josh, we if you we'll we'll put that in the resource list we'll create for this session, and that'll get uh, sent out to everyone who attended today. So. We'll, we'll make sure that everyone gets that, and we can link it on our page. Oh, fantastic. All right. I think we've probably got time for one or two more questions. Um, we've got had some questions from Bobby Wallace. If you could please press star six to unmute yourself. may not have Bobby Wallace on the line anymore. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Great. Hi. Um, hi, Bob Baines. Do you start with Bob? So um, I now manage the surface water for the city of Kirkland, and we're looking at using our surface water storm system ponds, which often are fenced and have surrounding landscape. It's interesting that you talk about the toxins and metals because we're going to avoid the pond itself and just plant the surrounding areas and find committed um, community members to help us maintain and harvest. Do you have any models of a similar program because surface water utility funds could be used to install, maintain, instead of general fund parks, that kind of thing? 
Hmm. You're saying uh, uh, planting fruit trees in or near uh, stormwater utility ponds. Is that what your question is? We're actually talking about edibles, including blueberries, nut trees, and fruit trees, so a combination of material. Yeah, um, I think they're out of us. I think um, we, we're trying to demonstrate um, more locally here just simply planting trees in and near uh, stormwater devices, rain gardens, and so forth. Um, there's often reluctance from the engineers to mix trees with those engineered water, you know, stormwater capture devices. We've, uh, in our own rain garden outside our building, we have shade trees and we have fruit trees like the pawpaw and persimmon. Um, and again, too young to bear fruit there, but, um, you know, simply just getting vegetation to survive in rain gardens is, is our first challenge and demonstrating that those trees that benefit to rain gardens is, you know, starting to take root around here in the Washington, D.C. area, but I am not aware of any edible landscape um, initiatives where it's focused on. It makes sense, though. I think mm -hmm. it makes sense. Um, I think the engineers and lawyers are concerned about people drowning in stormwater ponds, and <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I think it really depends on your culture um, mm -hmm. and where you're coming from. Um, yeah, blueberries and service berries should do well in a source close to water, um, but, Good. um, you know, I, I can't point to any specific success stories where, ah, oh, yeah, perfect example of a stormwater and an orchard project combined. Okay, well, we'll stay in contact with you because we're going to have a successful one. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thanks, great. Great. All right. Thanks, guys. Hey, I think, uh, we've just about taken all the questions that we can, but if you have any additional ones, Please feel free to send them our way. I know that Jim or Josh would be happy to uh, answer any additional questions that you might have. And many of the resources that we mentioned on the call today, from the organic pest management plans to uh, some of these studies, will include in the resource list that we'll send out to all participants uh, in about a week. As I mentioned, the presentation, uh, recording of this session, and the resource list will all be available in about one week um, on our website and Alliance for Community Trees will send links to all that out to everyone who can complete this brief survey. You can see it on the screen right there, and I will email it out to you in just a second. Please help us uh, know what you've liked about our webcasts, what you'd like to hear about, so that we make sure our programming relates to what you're doing and is helpful to your organization. Big, big thank you to our presenters today, Jim Woodworth and Josh Singer from Casey Trees, uh, showing us the nuts and bolts of fruit and nut trees. Clearly, there's a lot to learn. We really appreciate your sharing your advice and your experience. A big thank you as well to our partner on these webcasts, USDA Forest Service. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks, Leland. Thanks.